This is video 15 for artificial intelligence, and um, I'm going to finish off uh, the section on planning by talking about how one can um, transform a planning problem into one that can be solved using a SAT solver or a constraint satisfaction solver as an alternative to a specialized planning algorithm. So we're relying on the fact here that there are now incredibly sophisticated um, methods for implementing satisfiability solvers and also constraint satisfaction solvers. And initially, I'm going to talk about satisfiability. So I need to remind you of some uh, ideas associated with SAT solvers. What we want to do is take a sentence in propositional logic and establish whether or not there is a model for that sentence. Now, in propositional logic, a model is just an assignment of the value true or false to each of the variables in the propositional logic formula in such a way that the formula itself evaluates to be true. So a satisfiability solver will take a propositional logical formula in some format, and it will either output a model in the form of an assignment to each of the variables in the formula that makes the formula true, or it will output an indication that there is no model, there is no satisfying assignment um, that will make the formula come out true. And there are several satisfiability solvers around that will happily do this for real problems with millions of variables and if in conjunctive normal form, millions of clauses. So they're perfectly capable of uh, being applied to big, complicated, real problems. Now, the idea here is we want to take a planning problem and translate it into a sentence in propositional logic. Now, we're going to construct the sentence in a specific way so that it includes a description of the start state of our planning problem the descriptions of the actions that we might take in our, in our plan, and a description of the goal, and these are joined together with conjunctions. But we want to do it specifically so that if we can find a satisfying assignment, or a model, same thing, um, then M, the model, assigns true to a proposition if and only if it's in the plan. So there's a hint there that some of the propositions that we use in this sentence are going to correspond to actions. We also want the property that any assignment that doesn't correspond to a correct plan will also not be a model of this propositional sentence because the goal description won't be true. And we also want to ensure that the sentence is unsatisfiable if no plan exists. And as hopefully you will have inferred by now, is often the case, there are systematic ways in which we can take a planning problem and turn it into a, a sentence in propositional logic of this kind. Once again, I'm going to use an extremely simple example, both to illustrate how this works and to illustrate some of the um, difficulties that can arise. I'm now back to my roof climbers, and here I have two of them, one who is on the spire and one who is on the ground. And they want to swap places. So I can represent my start state very simply. My start state just says that at time 0, A is on the spire, and at time 0, B is on the ground. And it is not the case that at time 0, A is on the ground. And it is not the case that at time 0, B is on the spire. And the first thing you have to take into account here is that now, when you see something of the form at zero, a comma spire, it is in fact the name for a single proposition. I'm going to pause briefly so that that sinks in. Up until now, when you talked about propositional logic, you've seen sentences that look like a and B or not C. The names of your propositions there are A, B and C. Now 
we're using names that are somewhat more descriptive than that. We don't have to. It makes the, the whole thing an awful lot easier to understand. So here, this start state s, in other courses you would have written as a and b and not c and not d, because I have four different propositional names there, and I've decided not to call them a, b, c and d because I want them to be more descriptive, but they are names of propositional variables nonetheless. Now the, super, the superscripts that I'm putting on these uh, names indicate which step we're at in the plan. So my goal is going to look like the sentence I have here, g equals at some step i, a is on the ground, and at some step i, b is on the spire, and at some step i, a is not on the spire, and at some step i, b is not on the ground. Now, because these are fixed proposition names, if we want to express this goal at a bunch of different times, we will need a bunch of different copies, where the i has the times that we're interested in um, substituted. Okay? So, if for example we want to express the idea that the goal is supposed to happen at time 10, then the superscript i would be 10 here. Now that we've got a start state and a goal, we can talk about actions essentially using the equivalent of successor state axioms from the situation calculus. So I have something here that expresses the idea that A is on the ground at step 1, if and only if A was at the ground at step naught, and it is not the case that at step naught a moved from the ground to the spire, or A was at the spire at step naught, and A moved from the spire to the ground at step naught. So it's the same format as we used previously. Something is true at a step in the plan, if and only if it was true at the preceding step, and we didn't do something to make it false, or we did something specifically to make it true. And given a planning problem, we can represent the actions in that way, using individual successor state axioms. For this specific problem, if I now form the conjunction of the start state, the successor state axioms for the actions and the goal, I will find that the resulting sentence has a model in which move at step naught a from the spire to the ground, and move at step naught B from the ground to the spire, are both true, while all the remaining actions are assigned to be false. Now this is the key to how we're going to make this work. We want to set things up in such a way that if we get a satisfying assignment to our overall formula, then actions that are assigned true tell us the actions that we need to do and because there are copies of those actions for all the possible steps, not just move naught, but in a more realistic problem, we may have move one, move two, move three, and so on. We want to have an assignment that gives true to the specific actions at the specific steps that are needed to solve the problem. And because in a real problem, we won't know at what point the goal might actually be achieved, we start with a small time limit on how long a plan might last for, and we increase it. So we start with a final time t of 1, and we generate a goal that corresponds to that time, and we generate all the actions up to that time, and we try and find a model. And if we can't, because our sat solver returns an indication that the sentence is unsatisfiable, then we generate the whole thing again but we increase the, the time by one and try and extract a plan again. And we keep doing this until either we find a plan or we hit some maximum time and decide that we've, we're going to give up. Now that's all very nice, but as is always the case, it's not quite as uh, friendly as it looks at first glance. 
It's also the case in the system we've set up so far that the actions for moving B from the ground to the spire and A from the spire to the ground in the first step are both true, but that the action of moving A from the ground to the spire is true at the same time. Now I'm pretty sure that A doesn't want to be moved in both directions simultaneously, so we now need further axioms, essentially further entries in our propositional formula that stop such unwanted side effects from being possible. Now remember, if you have a sentence in propositional logic, uh, there may be many assignments that can satisfy it, not just one. And that's the case that we have here at the moment. So we may want to add a precondition axiom that says at any step i, if a is going to move from the ground to the spire, then A actually has to be at the ground to start with. And we would have copies of this for each of the relevant values of I. Now, if we add a third location, then things get more complicated. Because we may find that moving A from the spire to the ground and from the spire to hospital. And once again, I don't think that A wants to be moved in both directions at the same time. So we're going to need to specify that, that A can't move to two places at once. And that gives us action exclusion axioms. And here we're going to say that at step i, A can't move from the spire to the ground and from the spire to hospital, and so on. Now that's fine, but it tends to give you totally ordered plans rather than partially ordered plans. Remember again, the, the example of putting your shoes and socks on, you don't want a totally ordered plan that specifies in exactly what order this has to happen. You want a partially ordered plan that only constrains things enough such that any plan you do come up with that obeys the, the ordering constraints results in your goal of having your shoes and socks on. Now, alternatively to that, you can try and prevent actions occurring together if one negates the effect or precondition of another. You might specify that x can't be at L1 and at L2 at the same time, and include fragments of this form for all possible combinations of x, i, L1 and L2, where L1 and L2 are different. And that's an example of a state constraint. Now, I'm not going to go into any further depth in how you can encode planning problems as propositional satisfiability problems, because time is limited. Um, but hopefully that's enough to give you a taste of how you can go about doing this.